Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to bring to you the last and the finale session of the international lecture series on, on clinical nutrition. At the outset, let me take this opportunity to wish all the women who are attending today's session a happy International Women's Day. The theme for this year's Women's Day is Embrace Equity, and it highlights the critical difference between equity and equality. This International Women's Day has emphasized that equity is not just a nice thing to have, but a must have in every society's DNA. Let us hope, let us pray, and let us work together as women in the workforce to ensure that we create good opportunities for women around us. We let them have the crown higher and higher to reach a height that we have the right kind of gender equality with the men who are working with us. With this, let me introduce today's topic to you. Often when we have an obesity convention, we see a picture of a caveman. At least one presentation will have that with a cola in one hand and processed food in another. And then eventually, a presumably a very morbid obese man who is trying to tell everyone, let's go back. Now we know what's wrong, whether it's the scientific community or the general public. And yet we do not know what steps to take take or if at all we're doing interventions, we are failing to fight this something straightforward, yet a complex disease called obesity. Today, we're gonna to have some very inter interesting discussion around this topic. Obesity, as you know, is not a simple intake and output kind of equation. It involves genetics, it involves societal and environmental factors. Today, we spend a lot more time sitting in a car or commuting from one place to another, in spite of the technology advancing so much. We spend a lot of time on the chair, and as they say, sitting is the new smoking. The weight gain, um, a lot of the Asian and the African populations also have the tendency to put on more fat. We, got, we know that as the thrifty gene hypothesis. The prevalence of obesity is increasing, and this is concerning because obesity is associated with a plethora of other medical conditions. It, it predisposes people to type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance, cardiovascular disease, congestive heart failure, kidney disease, and non-alcoholic fatty disease. We also see thin fat people, people who otherwise appear healthy, but because of higher fat percentage have an increased predisposition for cardiovascular disease. So nutritional interventions are therefore very crucial. There is a lot of information out there. And today we have the best person to conduct a session and talk about the scientific evidence around um, obesity management. Let me take this opportunity to introduce our speaker for today, Ms. Ms. Neeti Desai Man. She is a senior clinical nutritionist and a celebrity dietitian with Nutrition Matters. She'll be talking on scientific weight management principles, recent trends, and evidence. She's been practicing for the last 17 years and was associated with Kambala Hill Hospital. She's a secretary and master trainer for Association of Diabetes Educators, co-editor of IDA's Clinical Dietetic Manual 2018, and has authored many chapters for various textbooks. She's also a joint treasurer for IDA Mumbai chapter and a regular columnist in newspapers for the last 18 years. She was also the official nutritionist for Femina Miss India 2008. Ma'am, over to you. We welcome you to conduct today's session. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sukala, for that kind in introduction. On the outset, I would like to thank you and uh, your team for having me here. Uh, if I can share the screen, please. Yes, ma'am. Yes, is that visible? Yeah, it's visible. All right. Good to go. Yeah. Um, a very good afternoon and evening to one and all, depending on which part of the world you are from. Um, on the outset, again, a very happy Women's Day to one and all, to all the women in the audience. Um, we are going to be talking about topic which everybody has an opinion about. Also, it is uh, considered to be rocket science 
and uh, there is perhaps more misinformation than information available. So we're going to sift through this and talk about only the scientific principles of weight management, and more importantly, also um, touching upon the recent trends and evidence for that. Um, so we all know that obesity is a staggering problem in terms of magnitude and its uh, impact on public health. Interestingly, this article was in today's uh, a newspaper where they are saying that by 2035, uh, more than half of the population of the world is going to be overweight and obese. In India, we are 25% of Indians at the moment are in the overweight and obese category. So uh, we, I don't need to emphasize how large is this problem. In fact, no medical condition has generated as many dietary approaches as obesity. And we all know that all the so-called lifestyle diseases or the non-NCDs, the non-communicable diseases have their origin in obesity. Uh, be it diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, gout, uh, all of them start with increased weight. Of course, obesity also leads to reduced life expectancy. And clearly, it's a huge healthcare burden, where which they are touting at four trillion by 2035 in the latest obesity, global obesity report. We know that excessive fat affects all the organ systems uh, adversely in different ways. And in fact, because of this, now obesity is recognized both as a chronic clinical condition and as a disease. It's not something uh, that only people who are considered lazy uh, uh, are supposed to be overweight or obese, but it's actually a disease. Uh, and a lot of the associations have kind of endorsed this. So what are the causes of obesity? We all know that primarily it is, of course, the imbalance of energy intake and energy expenditure. And there are various drivers towards uh, this imbalance. So if we classify them into homeostatic and non-homeostatic, homeostatic drivers are the ones that we, are, we know about. These are the hormones which are secreted in our body by different organs and which basically um, manage the energy balance. And uh, these hormones could be either from the gut or from the stomach or from the adipocytes. They a lot of them work at the on the brain, and that is how the energy balance is maintained. The poster boys of the energy metabolism are, of course, ghrelin and leptin, which um, most of us know about. Uh, and that is how, in fact, it is because of this homeostatic control in humans that we see examples of people who without ever monitoring their food intake or calculating how much to exercise remain within a relatively stable body weight range. And that is clearly when the homeostatic control is working well and it is supposed to work well. And then there are of course the non-homeostatic controls um, which primarily have environmental triggers and this is more common in this day and age. These environment triggers affect the non-homeostatic controls, which again affect the energy intake and the energy expenditure, both the sides of the equation. Uh, because of these triggers, there is increased consumption of high calorie foods. There has been easy availability of highly processed convenience foods, uh, which are delivered at your doorstep at the click of a button on your mobile in 15 minutes. Um, there are constant marketing messages going around, everything delivered in 15 minutes. Uh, and coupled to this, as Sukada mentioned, we are having an increasingly sedentary lifestyle. There has been a substantial increase in the screen time. Uh, of course, COVID has also uh, added to this problem where people have gotten used to seeing a um, lot of um, shows in the during the night. The sleeping hours have kind of uh, changed. 12 midnight and 1 a.m. has almost become a norm for a lot of families, leading to sleep deprivation also. And that is, of course, uh, the modern lifestyle, of course, has stress 
uh, always uh, has always been there. Uh, now, because of these non-homeostatic drivers, uh, which are present in the obesogenic environment, there has been an intake of hyper palatable calorie dense foods, uh, which allows large calorie consumption beyond the point of nourishment. The body doesn't need it. The human doesn't need it, but it's just been happening. Uh, coupled to that, the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages and marketing messages, which nudge our behavior, even subconsciously towards being more likely to overconsume such products. Um, buy one, get one free. Uh, the portion sizes have increased. All this is just adding to huge caloric intake from very refined foods. And that is what has led to what is now called as hedonic obesity. It is basically elevated body weight sustained by hedonic overeating that overrides all the homeostatic metabolic signals. Um, basically, hedonism means that you everything you do is for pleasure and uh, the pleasure is what gives you meaning to life. So um, in individuals who are susceptible to developing disorders of the hedonic system, the drive to eat can be so strong that it overrides all the inhibitory signals arising from the metabolic effects of food and potentially, of course, then stimulates weight gain. And this is what is now termed as hedonic obesity. This is something that is kind of uh, uh, new and it's been uh, se separated from the metabolic obesity that we've always talked about. In fact, there is a lot of... Um, if we go back, there's evidence even a long time ago, because when God said, do not eat apple, but because it was pleasurable, it was eaten. And it, it, it was, in fact, the first dietary invent, in, intervention that failed. Uh, so this hedonic pathway basically interacts with the obesogenic environment, the triggers, which are just all around, as you can see here. Uh, and it overrides the homeostatic mechanism. And the weight gain sustained over time, in fact, leads to an upward setting of your set point of weight. So now the body is used to a higher weight than what was supposed to be your genetically determined weight. And coupled to this is, besides the easy availability, the issue of portion sizes. 20 years ago, a cup of coffee would be around 50 calories. Now it could be anywhere from 400 to 600 calories. Uh, popcorn at your movie theater would cost you 270 calories. Well, now a tub of popcorn would be 1000 calories plus. So it's just all pervasive and it's all over the place. And therefore the increasing worldwide prevalence of obesity is partially related to the ready availability of these highly palatable foods, which increases the incidence of hedonic non-homeostatic feeding. And in fact, uh, this food addiction hypothesis postulates that exposure to these foods alters the brain's reward circuitry, driving an addiction-like behavioral phenotype of compulsive overeating. And as you can see here, it has been studied. In fact, there has been an RCT and it has been seen that when equal calories were given, um, the caloric intake from processed food was way higher. People tended to eat a lot more of that, as you can see here. And obviously the weight gain also over time was huge compared to an unprocessed healthy diet. So the macronutrients all, also matter uh, where the calories are coming from. It's not just uh, calories, the calories, the calorie. And also then, as I said, since we are talking about pleasures of eating, if you eat something and no one sees you eat it, perhaps it has no calories. So uh, this hedonic hunger has been studied in detail. And in fact, it has been identified that this, this hedonic intake is in fact regulated by orexin and dynorphin peptides in the PVN area of the brain. And in fact, the intake correlates with the expression of their receptors. Uh, here you can see that even the, the, the intake, the hunger and the sensor 
sensory uh, uh, markers, there is a kind of a correlation. So optical stimulation of these um, peptides, just by looking at the visual, at food or even the food pictures can uh, release dopamine. And this in fact increases the food cue directed orientation in almost a Pavlovian manner that you just can't help it. You will just go for it. And to couple it, obesity further alters the expression of these receptors. So it's kind of then goes into a vicious cycle. So the recent developments in this area of neurobiology of obesity basically tells us that we knew that brain plays a key role in the control of energy intake and expenditure. And many genes are associated uh, with, with obesity, which are basically expressed at the CNS level. But the recent advances tell, tell us that the traditional view of homeostatic regulation of body weight by mainly the hypothalamus is not the only, uh, only part of the brain which controls. In fact, the hedonic controls of appetite come from the corticolimbic and the hindbrain. And these, in fact, process the external sensory information, the reward and emotion are then correlated with these triggers uh, in the obesogenic environment. So because of this, much of this interactive neural processing is outside awareness, uh, in a world of plenty, it is, in fact, very difficult to prevent uh, not eating. So it, we cannot always blame the person because at times beyond a point, the person also does not know how to control it. And therefore, in fact, the treatment of obesity is now even more complicated and it should be more rationally directed to the complex mechanisms underlying these interactions. So firstly, the Obesity disposing genes may exert their influence not only on classical homeostatic pathways, but also on the large brain areas, the other areas involved in the hedonic aspects of food intake. Second, because hedonic processes are intricately in in interacting with homeostatic processes, uh, hedonic processes are also less under conscious control now. Third, the complexity of these neural pathways uh, suggest combination therapies that attack more than one mechanism to be most efficient in combating obesity. Uh, the other non-homeostatic drivers are sleep deprivation, as I just mentioned. And what are the new findings here? Well, sleep deprivation may mediate increase in BMI through elevated ghrelin, suppressed leptin, and augmented hedonic signaling during feed, food intake, which we would have all experience at times when you're sleep deprived, you're not, you're awake for a long time. You try and go open up the fridge and remove a box, your box of ice cream or some sweets. Nobody eats healthy when one is sleep deprived. In fact, decreased sleep also results in increased fatigue, which may lower the cap capability to exercise. So now you're not even burning the calories. Obesity increases the risk for sleep disorders. We all know that like sleep dis uh, apnea, which may compromise sleep quality. And again, a vicious cycle is set up. And then there is also the connection between circadian rhythm and obesity. Modern lifestyles, including shift work and exposure to blue light, the screen time has increasingly led to a misalignment between food intake and the circadian rhythm. Uh, studies have shown that misaligning feeding time with circadian rhythm is associated with obesity. In fact, nighttime binging that I just mentioned about is a worse form of dietary intake when it comes to uh, weight gain uh, or efforts at losing weight. So how how many, well, how many factors are there which are influencing our energy balance? Well, it is not as easy as calories in and calories out equation for obesity. And there are multiple uh, factors which affect this. And it's, of course, kind of complicated. It's not that easy. So then what works? How do we tackle this problem? Well, to begin with, we need to first 
identify the scale of the issue uh, for the person, for the patient, for the client. And for this, we need to use Edmonton Obesity Staging System, which is a five-stage system which considers the metabolic, physical, and psychological parameters, not just the weight, not just the BMI. And in fact, this system has been report reported to be a better predictor of mortality uh, than BMI or even metabolic syndrome. This system intends to provide clinically relevant insight into health-related risks for those with obesity. So it's not only about the numbers, it's also whether it is a whether you are having comorbidities, whether you are having knee problems, whether you are having sleep uh, apnea. So all these are kind of taken into consideration, uh, and you are staged into stage one, two, three, four, uh, and accordingly the treatment is planned. Of course, this is the traditional way of uh, classifying uh, obesity on the basis of BMI. And we know that Asian cutoffs are different from the traditional WHO criteria, which are for the, uh, the generally for the developed world, for the white race. And we have much lower BMI cutoffs uh, uh, to uh, achieve uh, that, to target because uh, of the increased incidence of many of the NCDs at a younger age in the uh, population. So parameters to define obesity in Indians, BMI less than 23, waist circumference for men and women, waist hip ratio for men and women, and the body fat percentage. Uh, these are kind of, as I said, different, and they are much tighter than the WHO criteria for the world. Um, so the treatment algorithm depends on the, your, the EOSS staging, uh, if you are in the stage zero, then it's only lifestyle modification. Otherwise, it would be behavioral therapy, advancing to medical uh, pharmacotherapy, and then lastly, maybe surgical intervention. So what the staging system tells us that weight loss target should not be the only goal. It's not just the number, five kilos, seven kilos, 10 kilos. It is important to explain why client needs to lose weight. Uh, what do you want to achieve from the weight loss? Improved glycemic control, reduction of blood pressure, um, less knee pain, because this is very important because it also helps with adjusting expectation and even the perception of failure uh, amongst patients. Because even if you don't lose weight, but if your sugar gets control gets better, that itself is a huge achievement and a motivating factor to continue the weight loss journey. So what is a successful weight loss? What should we be looking at generally? Uh, we all know that when we tell a, a patient, if a patient has to lose 20 to 30 kilos, it's not going to happen. It's a daunting task. In fact, as little as three to 5% weight loss has shown to have improved outcomes. And in fact, most clinical guidelines suggest that about we should be aiming at 5 to 10% of weight loss, not because it is the optimal, as I said, but because it is achievable enough to be recommended in clinical practice. And it, of course, gives improved outcomes. All the parameters kind of uh, go come down even with a modest 5% to 10% weight loss. So how do we tackle obesity? We all know there are three components. We start off with lifestyle modification, then go to pharmacotherapy. And last option is, of course, the surgical option. The lifestyle modification has three components, the diet modification, movement modification, and behavioral modification. Some number crunching here. We all know that a kilo of fat is 7,000 calories. So if we create a daily calorie deficit of 500 calories, then we would be losing a kilo every two weeks. How long will it take? As you know, that's the question that all patients ask. That's the first question they ask. And a sensible and realistic goal is half to one kilo a week. Of course, as you all know, higher the BMI, the faster is the weight loss to begin with. So um, that is how I motivate my morbidly obese or very obese patients that 
you will lose, if you put in the effort, you will lose faster than somebody who has to lose less weight. We all know about the many, very many popular weight loss interventions. Um, as I say, diets come and go. And there are the detox, there's the detox diet, the low carb diet, the paleo, vegan, gluten free, dairy free, keto, intermittent fasting, and the list can go on. Um, the diets, as I said, they come and go. Uh, different diets have different uh, flavors of the season. Uh, different parts of the, uh, as we've gone along. In fact, all the fat diets work on the principle of restriction of entire food groups. You are dairy uh, free, you completely avoid dairy, gluten free, you completely avoid gluten or wheat. Uh, so a lot of carbs are eliminated. This obviously limits your choices, calorie intake drops and weight loss occurs. Uh, a drastic reduction in caloric intake uh, will also lead to lower BMR. These kind of crash diets do not help people to change their original eating habits. So one goes back to old habits and the weight regain is even more uh, than what one has lost. So a sensible dietary strategy to promote adherence has to have two components in place, palatability and satiety. You may put the best diet in the world on your prescription, let bad, but if it is not pal palatable, if it's not tasty, it's not going to work. Um, satiety, of course, extremely important. And when we talk of satiety, the protein and the fiber component comes in because these are the two food groups, food components, the macronutrients, which are have a very strong influence on satiety, helps person feel full, because we do not expect our patients to eat less, remain hungry, and lose weight. That's not going to happen. They will do it for four days, five days a week if they're motivated, but then they're going to it's, they're going to drop off. Protein foods, of course, delay gastric emptying, so one feels full for a longer time. Protein also prevents insulin spikes, so there are less food cravings. High fiber foods, of course, have reduced caloric density. Uh, makes you feel full without the calories, also delays gastric emptying and therefore promotes satiety. So we are looking at a diet with a caloric distribution of 50 to 55% calories coming from carbs. Protein should be at least 10%. In our Indian scenario, we know that we are a carb loving nation and we are nowhere near that. We are not even meeting our basic protein requirements of one gram, 0.8 to one gram per kg body weight. Uh, I will not be going into those details um, uh, on this uh, today. So if we follow the basic plate model where 20 5%, little less than 25% of your plate has a protein food and 50% has high fiber uh, cereals and uh, vegetables and salads, uh, then you are more or less managing to get this caloric distribution. This is in a very, very simplistic way how we would explain to patients. The flavor of the season, we know is has been intermittent fasting since last couple of years. This has been a very popular uh, regime uh, that is being followed. I think we are going to be discussing this in our panel discussion. So I will not go into the details here, but the latest research shows, uh, this is the most current research, that uh, these study, the, the meta-analysis found that there was no significant difference in the BMI, but there was a significant difference in the body weight. Uh, so clearly this means that the body weight uh, change was not significant to even affect the BMI. And then there has been another review which says that IF does not appear to be more effective than the traditional diets. Uh, it will be effective only when there is energy restriction. So intermittent fasting with caloric restriction works, clearly works. But if people think that intermittent fasting gives them a license to eat whatever in those eight hours or six hours, it will not work. 
ketogenic diet is the other diet which has been there for a while. Uh, again, we'll be discussing it in the panel discussion. But I think one of the biggest issue here is that the carb content of keto diet is very, very poor, is very low. And therefore, obviously, one needs one cuts back on fruits and most of the vegetables. This means that one is depriving one's body of a variety of nutrients, um, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. So uh, that's a big challenge. And again, interestingly, this is a article of uh, two days ago, um, research published in AJCN um, tells us that keto, uh, obviously diet is high in animal foods and lower in plant foods. And therefore, they have been associated with negative effects on blood lipids, specifically increasing LDL cholesterol, which we see all the time in practice, raising concern about the long-term health outcomes associated with keto diet. Besides that, it is not even environmentally friend friendly. It's bad for the planet. Um, so that's an additional uh, issue. Over-ingestion of high fat like through keto diets or even through hedonic eating, eating for pleasure, can rapidly produce hypothalamic inflammation and damage causing the set point to change. So in fact, now this has been seen even in obese rodents and humans that we start defending now new higher body weight rather than the pre-obesity lean body weight. Uh, so every time we do this, there is a new set point created. Meal replacers is also a strategy uh, for weight loss uh, on very low calorie diets. I use them as well uh, in selected patients. Again, because we are going to be discussing this in the panel discussion, I won't go into the details of this. Functional foods. Everyone always is looking out for those, those magic foods which can just melt the fat away or which can help with weight loss. Um, and this is a huge multi-million dollar industry, as we all know. However, again, the current evidence says that the scientific evidence is unclear and in most cases controversial and more clinical and epidemiological studies are required. Now, this is whether we talk about coffee, green tea, we talk about berries, um, do not have, so whether it's caffeine or the capsaicin or the quercetin or the polyphenol, we do not have sufficient evidence. There is some evidence for these two uh, functional foods or nutraceuticals, Garcinia cambogia. Uh, there is, it does help the weight loss effort, not that we get some dramatic results. As we always say, there is no magic pill as yet. Apple cider vinegar, there is evidence that it delays gastric emptying. So in fact, uh, people who feel very hungry, even after having the meal immediately, um, we could use this to delay gastric emptying. It helps obviously increase satiety. Microbiota is again, something that is discussed in every fora, uh, be it any disease condition or obesity. Uh, there has been some evidence that there is dysbiosis in obese individuals. And in fact, uh, Provotella is the genus of uh, bacteria, which in fact may help with weight loss. But with the current level of evidence, there is nothing that we can suggest or use for our patients. Physical activity, as we know, is the next component, the movement uh, modification is the next big component that we need to discuss about. And this is because calories count, right? You have a can of Coke and that would, you will be able to burn those calories if you stand there for, stand for 55 for nearly an hour. And a large portion of French fries would be burnt only if you iron clothes for four hours and eight minutes. So movement is very important. The only thing is it's very difficult to move as much as quickly as you can take in the calories. The WHO guidelines says that we need to encourage moderate intensity activity of 150 to 300 minutes in a week 
or a vigorous intensity activity of 75 to 150 minutes in a week, or of course a combination. Need to limit the amount of time spent being sedentary. As we know, sitting is the new smoking and replace the sitting sedentary time with any kind of physical activity in the office during your lunch break or whenever possible. Uh, increasing physical activity has too many uh, beneficial effects. On short term, it increases strength, balance, mood, uh, appetite regulation. On long term, of course, it helps improve bone density, cognition, uh, increases lean body mass, and of course, imp improves cardiovascular function. Uh, Movement reduces health risks from many of the conditions, many of the uh, lifestyle NCDs. And in fact, the hedonic theory that we discussed uh, for eating can be in fact used positively when it comes to activity because uh, the hedonic theory is the idea that human behavior is motivated by the pursuit of pleasure as we discussed. So if patients find the physical activity pleasurable, then we can encourage clients to engage in the same physical activity that they enjoy, because then only it's going to be something that is sustainable. Increased enjoyment will lead to increased motivation to continue. So we must spend sufficient time to explore with our client what kind of activity they inherently enjoy uh, and not just give out the diet prescription. WHO recommends screen-free time for four to two hours. You need to be away from your mobile, from any kind of screen for at least two hours in the day. And this has been the transition uh, uh, over the years because of uh, the, the TV or the screen time. Besides this, uh, burning calories, there is also Another issue, the calories out have an effect on calories in because at very low levels of physical activity, there seems to be an inability to control appetite and an energy intake appropriately. Uh, whereas at high levels of physical activity, there seems to be an ability for an, uh, to be able to match the caloric intake with the expenditure. And of course, higher levels of physical activity can regulate appetite and energy intake. The third component, behavioral modifications, interventions. Well, there's a paradigm shift now. We need to look at adherence and not compliance. We've always been looking at compliant patients. It's a very restrictive, submissive involvement of individual where they have a passive role to play. But we are looking at adherence where an independent, intelligent, decision-making individual is a part of the discussion and is playing an active role. Uh, and we can make our patients more adherent by empowering the, them with information, the correct information. And this information could be very, some, very simple as some pra, uh, tricks for mindful eating, for example, pausing between bites, picking up a dessert plate rather than the large plate to serve oneself. Uh, being away from uh, stimulus, uh, from environment which are highly stimulating, like a buffet room um, or uh, in a party room, once you're done with your dinner, you need to move away from that room and not be just around. So very, very simple tricks can help. Uh, we need to seek family support because that increases the adherence. Um, and of course, we need to appreciate and encourage uh, our patients for the, the smallest uh, gains that they have made uh, and also free them of guilt because it doesn't matter what you eat between Christmas and New Year. It's what you eat between New Year and Christmas that counts. So these are some of the perspectives which we need to share with our patients. Also give them inputs on how to eat when they are traveling or when they are uh, going to restaurants making them understand food labels, because this can be a very, very tricky uh, one. Um, you could be uh, unnecessarily taking in more calories because you're not able to read food labels. They, a lot of patients try to read them, but uh, we need to educate them on that. And most importantly, be realistic. Adopt, uh, for the most part, strategy. 
eating healthy and moving for the most part instead of stressing on 100% perfection. 80-20 guidelines is what we are looking at. They must have a rewarding meal, a reward meal, a cheat meal every week uh, to uh, help with the effort and to keep the plan more sustainable. To make a diet work, a diet must fit the lifestyle and not the other way around. And the best diet is the one that one will stick to. It could be any diet, it could be any formulation, but the consistency is most important. There are five A's of weight management program. Uh, this is something that is used even in smoking cessation. In fact, that's how it had started. Uh, you need to ask for permission to discuss weight because weight is a sensitive issue. Assess their patient for their class as we discussed the staging, use the staging system and also assess the obesity drivers. What is the cause of obesity, weight gain and also the barriers? So the barriers could be uh, the four M's, mental, mechanical, metabolic or monetary. We need to discuss this, identify this then only we can provide solutions and also figure out whether the weight gain is due to a slow metabolism. Is it because of increased food intake? Is it because of reduced activity or it's a combination of all? Because then only the solution will be personalized. Need to advise them on benefits of modest weight loss as we discuss uh, even uh, the risk reduction as it's shown in the DPP trial from five kilos to 10 kilos, there's a significant risk reduction in the incidence of diabetes. So uh, we need to highlight this, not just harp on the number of kilos to be lost, uh, emphasize the importance of weight maintenance because that's uh, another um, battle to be won. Uh, treatment options that we discuss, agree on a realistic weight loss goal, and we should understand that lifestyle modification generally gives a result from around five, if with a very good patients up to 10%, but not more. And then if pharmacotherapy comes in, we can have a higher weight reduction. Treatment plan should be realistic and the success of treatment should be measured in improvements in health parameters and well-being, and not just the number of kilos lost. Uh, we need to assist our patients by giving patient education, uh, credible patient education, and arrange follow-up. Because this is a chronic relapsing condition, a long-term follow-up is too, very essential, and success is in fact directly related to the frequency of provider contact. Uh, so follow the SMART strategy, uh, be specific, have measurable goals, uh, action-oriented and realistic and timely. They need to come back in two weeks time, in three weeks time, in 10 days time. Uh, define the problem. I want to lose five kilos. I will eat two servings of vegetables five days out of seven. Uh, so it needs to be measurable and action-oriented. Just by saying eat less, exercise more and you lose weight, it's not going to happen. Uh, Long-term maintenance, as I said, it's a relapsing condition. So 50% of people uh, regain their weight in two years and 80% in five years. Regular physical activity is the key to weight maintenance. Um, so a successful weight maintenance would be when somebody is lost between five to 10% of the initial body weight, maintained it over three years, at least not gained over three years, maintained it for three to seven years, and there has been improvement in the parameters. So a multidisciplinary team, two, two, two important, can't emphasize more, a therapist, when it is also hedonic uh, eating for sure, uh, a gynecologist, a diabetologist, and a GP, very, very important. Uh, because uh, diet, nutrition, diet is not the only part of this complicated equation. When lifestyle modification does not work, then pharmacotherapy comes in. And here there is a lot of good news, recent advances. In fact, 
semaglutide um, is uh, kind of the wonder drug. It's the flavor of the season. It's a GLP-1 RA, and uh, it is giving us first in class drug to provide more than 15% weight loss, okay, which we haven't seen. We've not had any drug which gives um, this kind of significant weight loss. So all the step trials, all the trials of this drug have given very good results. There is another block drug on the market on the block, which is used in diabetes, is giving a higher weight loss than even semaglutide. But it is uh, FDA in the US is maybe this year will approve it for just weight loss in non-diabetics. But for us, it's not uh, available at the moment. Uh, lastly, if for the morbidly obese or people who are very obese with multiple comorbidities, then surgical intervention is the last option uh, and perhaps the best option because surgical intervention always gives way better results than the earlier uh, interventions that we discussed. Depending on the type of surgery, it could be anywhere from 7% to 38% and even 50% that we have seen. There is a lot of uh, exciting news, even in uh, this invasive uh, modalities, there is uh, the use of intragastric balloons where it is not permanent, but it is temporary. But of course, this is for another session. So uh, in conclusion, uh, the take home messages, various causes of obesity are there. It's home that, and it could be homeostatic and non-homeostatic. Uh, the newer concept of hedonic obesity is has come in, um, which works along with metabolic obesity, or it is perhaps overriding metabolic obesity now. Popular weight loss diets may do more harm than good, and there is weight cycling that we discussed about. Three-pronged strategy approach for lifestyle modification, the diet, physical activity, and of course, behavioral modification. Be realistic with the client. Um, 5 to 10 percent weight loss is very good news. Empower the client with knowledge. Focus on smart goals as we discussed. Rope in more health call, healthcare professionals, HCPs if needed. Food is just one part of the equation. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, ma'am. That was indeed a very comprehensive, um, you know, we covered the topic very comprehensively, right from pharmacotherapy to nutrition management and different kinds of diets um, that we see, you know, in, in, in the market today. So thank you so much for covering that. I'm going to straight away head to the panel discussion. I would like to invite all the panelists on board. Uh, so we've already heard from Ms. CP Desai, ma'am. Our next speaker is Ms. Nazim Hussain. She, a second. she is um, the chairperson of the Ethics Nutrify Today. She's the founder of Freedom Wellness Clinic, National Executive Committee member of Indian Dietetic Association, Nutrition Advisor for INS Hamla Joint Services and Institute of Catering and Technology, Head Dietitian at Yoga Institute of Santa Cruz and Chief Nutritionist for Stead Plus Football, Football Academy, Rashi Sogar. She's also the ex-president of ID Mumbai chapter, and she again has a lot of, um, she's been a regular columnist and has a lot of papers, um, has presented it in various conferences, etc. So I welcome you, ma'am. Thank you, Sukhada. Our next speaker is Ms. Tamanna Chaudhary. Uh, she is a clinical dietitian from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Um, she holds an MSc in food nutrition from University of Dhaka and an MPH from North South University, Dhaka. She has a PhD in diabetic education by Project Hope USA. She has special clinical nutrition training from India. She's a regional secretary of Bangladesh at IP Indian Association of Parental and Enteral Nutrition, which is IPIN. General Secretary of Bangladesh Nutrition and Dietetics Forum. She's also a diet instructor at Lux Channel One Superstar and a columnist at various newspapers and online news. Welcome you, Ms. Tamanna. Uh, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Eileen Kainde. She is the Chief Dietitian at Sir H. N. Reliance Foundation Hospital. She has an experience of, of practicing since 1997, has been a Chief Dietitian at Bridge Canyon Prince Ali Khan Hospital as well. 
She holds a PhD in nutrition and a registered diet has been a registered dietitian since 1998, an RD board member and a joint secretary at IPIN. She's also ESPEN certified, um, certified with Monash University for IBS and FODMAP, nutrigenic counselor, uh, a certified diabetes educator. And she has many publications in national and international publications like Elsevier, Research Reach, and other presentations in the US, Sri Lanka, and Dubai. We welcome you, Dr. Eileen. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Ruby Sound, and she's a consultant dietitian at Eight Wise Nutrition and Wellness Clinic and Sangeeta Maternity Hospital. She's a secretary of Indian Dietetic Association Mumbai chapter and a managing committee member of the PCS Society of India. She's also certified in neurolinguistic uh, as a uh, neurolinguistic practitioner and a Pilates trainer level one. She is a recipient of Women of the Year 2015 by PVR Nest. And again, she has a, a lot of uh, publications and presentations to her credit. We welcome you, Ruby. Thank you so much. Request all the panelists to switch on the cameras. Yeah. So let's begin. So my first question is, um, I think I'll start with Dr. Eileen. Um, how can a meal replacer help individuals with morbid obesity? Are they effective in making people lose weight before a bariatric surgery? Is it something that uh, is essential? And what has been your experience? Hello? You're on mute. Okay, so meal replacers can be a helpful tool uh, in a weight loss uh, journey. Uh, and they, because we know that meal replacers are designed in such a way that they are low calories, they are convenient. Uh, and moreover, these days, there are meal replacers which are available, which have a balanced, uh, you know, uh, calorie and protein and uh, fat content along with vitamins and minerals. So they can be replaced with an entire meal. Uh, However, uh, you know, uh, it depends upon which meal you are placing. It could contain uh, anywhere from 200 to even 400 calories. Uh, although these meal replacers are easily available, it is still necessary for a dietitian uh, or a nutritionist to design that particular meal, whether that person needs a 400 calorie meal or a 200 calorie meal. And these uh, meal replacers are specially used for people uh, who have convenience in, you know, uh, preparing a meal easily by themselves, especially college students, people who are working, who do not have time to cook or who do not have time to uh, make meals uh, for themselves or carry it to work. Or uh, in many cases, even people who are undergoing bariatric surgeries. Uh, in that program also, uh, they are put on a meal replacement uh, a few weeks uh, before their surgery because it helps them lose weight and uh, that also helps to decrease the complications of the surgery. So overall, a meal replacer is a good idea. Uh, it has to be had in the right manner and prescribed by the right person. Yeah. I think in continuation to this, there is one question in the chat box as well. Um, how can use of meal replacers go wrong? Like, what could be some of the concerns that you see? Uh, be it because we see a lot of uh, general public prescribing meal replacers. So, what could be some of the complications that we see with use of meal replacers? Okay, so first of all, choosing the correct meal replacer. Because today there are meal replacers available with a lot of herbal content in it. Uh, they could have heavy metals in it. They could have other ingredients which are uh, so-called weight loss ingredients, but they may not be the correct ingredient. So if it is just taken over the counter or taken without a prescription or help of a dietitian, that may be the major concern for health safety. Uh, the other concern is that uh, you may not uh, be uh, equipped enough to count your own calories. Whether you are on, if you are on an 800 calorie diet and you need 200 uh, calories of a meal replacer and that meal, you may just land up eating 400 calories instead of 200 calories. So uh, technically you may go wrong in, in that way. And thirdly is you may 
just consume a meal replace her after a meal and <laughs> that may just not further lead to any further weight loss yeah it may actually lead to weight gain so yeah. it's re- really important to judiciously use the meal replacer and choose a meal replacer that is scientifically designed so for example when you look at the regulations here in india by the fsci a minimum 200 calorie meal replacer is required you cannot have a meal replacer that has less than 200 calories so that's something that we can probably look at when selecting a meal replacer um in continuation to this i think my next question is to ms tamanna how has been your experience of using meal replacers in your patients and are they effective in making people lose weight do you see compliance from patients what has been your experience thank you basically you know in bangladesh uh, very recently we are having our commercial feed or meal replacer uh, in our hospital last 4 5 years we are using it and especially i want to give one example during covid most of the patient who came to um, our hospital Uh, in our icu who admitted most of them are obese we take the data after uh, doing their nutritional assessment and in during covid time nutrition was a challenge so most of them them are obese their calorie intake their high protein demand and their other micronutrition um, requirement we have to fulfill at that time we use the meal replacer in our hospital with our daily regular menus or as ng feed or as a take feed it successfully we using it and nowadays whenever second time post covid complications when the patient came to our hospital they asked for the any kind of meal replacer from us so this is the very good example during covid we realized that the, that kind of meal replacer we must need especially for the critically ill patient who are obese and this is one of the most uh, you know significant uh, challenges for the obese person that low calorie high protein and the adequate amount of micronutrition we have to provide so simultaneously with the other regular food a meal replacer is a very helping for us where it aids in weight loss without actually giving up muscle mass uh, ma- i mean muscle mass loss yeah. so so i think choosing again or uh, something that will give you a high protein not just uh, lesser calories is also something that's very important mm-hmm. and that can help in hospitalized patients as well like you rightly said mm-hmm. um so i think nasim ma'am my next mm-hmm. question is to you um we often talk about calories when we talk about weight management what about the protein intake or the fiber intake now we, we have ms tamanna here from bangladesh and Uh, our nations have starkly different protein intakes so different kinds of diets that we consume so protein and fiber are kind of very important and today there is a lot of research that talks about their role in weight management so what is your uh, take on that i think that's an excellent question and uh, first of all thank you for having us on this panel and i think this has been a beautiful series uh so more specifically for proteins and like niti also presented i think the role of protein is very immense one that you know a higher protein diet, uh, intake can actually completely increase your satiety level it can help in reducing the appetite uh, and also the hormones especially glp1 yy peptide uh, cytosine all of them are reduced so that is very important so even replacing a small part of the carbs with protein can actually help you reduce the hunger hormone the second part niti also covered was the hedonic uh, obesity and i think protein has a very significant role to play over there as well because when we are looking at protein food it actually helps in reducing the appetite so simply spacing your protein meal at uh, increasing a little bit of protein at every meal including breakfast lunch and dinner can overall help you a lot in you know curbing these uh, you know cravings especially the nighttime binges and there are plenty of studies which actually support that so uh, also the overall thermic effect of protein is higher so if a person is consuming around 100 calories and you look at the thermic effect of uh, food coming from proteins is almost 30% uh, 30% 
in short what you're using is only 70 uh, kilocalories as usable calories per 100 uh, kilocalories so that's another benefit of protein and also protein helps you to burn much more calories so your calories out factor becomes much higher the other partner to protein is the fiber and uh, fiber again a lot of work has been done when it helps in satiety it also today the kind of choice you make for a fiber is very important so whilst we all understand soluble fiber and insoluble fiber soluble fiber predominantly has a larger role so that would come from your legumes fruits with skin and also a lot of uh, factors also glucomannan is one of the fibers which is proven and i think most of the meal replacers also use this fiber so that's something which is very uh, good also fiber acts like a prebiotic uh, and so overall helps in the gut uh, you know improving the gut biosis as well thank you so much that's a very good segue for my next question um, so including protein and fiber consciously in each meals is something very important and today we also have a lot of studies in people with diabetes when we talk about including or starting your meal with a fiber or a protein uh, you know rich food that will help you blunt the glycemic response and as a result of which better metabolic health as well so uh, my next question is to you ruby uh, talking about the gut, you know, uh, when we talk about protein, it's also important to talk about the gut dysbiosis as well. And there are a lot of studies that talk about a difference in the functional profile of the microbiome that is associated with the body's response to weight loss interventions, be it ketogenic diet or uh, intermittent fasting. So how can we ensure that we have the optimum gut microbiome? For weight management initiatives to be successful and to be sustained. Thank you for the question, Sukhuta. I had a very strong gut feeling that you'll <laughs> ask me about the gut, that that important gut is today, whether it is about our feelings or whether it is about weight loss management. Well, um, earlier these were studies only in the mice and today it is proven that uh, the diet itself that we consume has a direct effect on the inner gut world that we all have, right? So when we talk of different nutrients and uh, especially when we talk of obese people who consume a lot of high saturated fatty acids, refined carbohydrates, their gut composition is completely different from the gut of a lean person or who includes a lot of protein and fiber. So in technical terms, there's a gut dysbiosis. <clears throat> so in obese people, you'll see a lot of uh, formicutes, that is a species of bacteria. And in the Lean, you will see a lot of bacteroid. Now, this dispalms itself causes a low-grade inflammation in the body. So, somewhere we have to make an attempt to reverse this gut dysbiosis. Okay. And how do we do that? Of course, reversing the whole approach towards it. When we are trying to do that, we are actually not only trying to improve the uh, gut-brain axis, but also trying to achieve a significant amount of weight loss and fat loss. And that is very much achievable by including protein and fiber in the diet. What Razin rightly said. Another advantage of including protein is the nitrogen present in the uh, form of protein is going to be feeding the microbes. And that's going to really help them in producing the metabolites which we require. So the microbes usually secrete the short chain fatty acids if they are flourishing. And that's what we really need to make sure that there is a better gut hormones which are released and the gut homeostasis is re-established. If you see a lot of short chain fatty acids like the acetates, the butyrates, uh, which are produced by the uh, microbes as metabolites. So if we want to reverse that inclusion of dietary protein and fiber again, we know fiber actually is a form of prebiotics. We know that prebiotics are actually the, you know, the non-digested uh, uh, food which the microbes feed on. So if we are including fiber, we are providing them with adequate amount of nutrients to flourish. Besides this, what is also important is, like you rightly said, that using our meal replaces is very, very, uh, you know, uh, convenient, like in Bangladesh and India both. Also, low-calorie diets have shown to improve the uh, gut microbiome. And very, very recently, like Neeti Ma'am discussed, even aerobic activity, including 30 to 60 minutes of activity every day, can actually bring a change in the balance of these two Gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So these small, small changes will eventually bring the homeostasis 
and reverse it. And a lot of studies have been uh, published. And I think um, uh, everybody needs to talk about including probiotics and prebiotics when we talk about gut weight management. Thanks so much for that, Ruby. I think a balance of all the macronutrients and micronutrients is also something very important. If you do too much of protein or if you do too much of fat, like in ketogenic diet, that's also kind kind of leads to a little bit of gut disbalance. So having a perfect balance, and this is where I think dietitians have a very big role to, uh, you know, scientifically manage weight. And it's not uh, a very simple, you know, uh, it's it, there's science to weight loss. So dietitians should be involved in management of weight. So thank you so much for your input, Ruby. Um, Neeti, ma'am, I think in continuation with this, there are a lot of adjuncts that are available in the market. So, you know, be it probiotics or you have a lot of these extracts that are available. You, you mentioned about apple cider vinegar uh, or grapeseed extract, Garcinia kombucha. How effective are they? And can they work in isolation? So, you know, a lot of the times patients come to us and they will say, okay, give me a Garcinia kombucha capsule or... Uh, you know, I'm taking apple cider vinegar for the last couple of months and I've not lost or lost so much weight. So what are your insights on that? These are, as you said, Sukhata, these are adjuncts. These are unfortunately no magic pills. So the the basis, uh, the basic, what we discussed, the fundamentals of calorie restriction with the correct micro, macro and micronutrient with increased physical activity, that equation remains. Now, to just give that additional push, uh, we do use, uh, as I said, apple cider vinegar. There is very strong evidence uh, that it does delay gastric uh, emptying. It does not burn fat. A lot of people think that apple cider vinegar burns fat. They have it first thing in the morning. And then a lot of them times they say, oh, this gives me acidity, so I'm not going to have it. Uh, so uh, this is, as I said, there's so much of misinformation, but even these adjuncts have to be had the right, in the right way. Garcinia Cambogia, we are not getting any dramatic results like we would get with what we are getting with semaglutide with the pharmacotherapic agents, but it's, it's, it's an additional uh, help. Also, what I've seen in practice is then when these adjuncts are given, uh, the pers- the patient, the client feels that somebody else is also helping him or her with the efforts. So the compliance is in fact, or adherence now is better uh, when with the calorie restricted diet and physical activity, we are also giving, uh, we are using these adjuncts, but the caveat is it's no magic pill. If you continue with your habits and just pop in this pill and you think the fat is melting away, you're going to lose weight, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So overall diet and lifestyle changes required. Um, absolutely. There, there are quite a lot of uh, dietitians or participants asking, you know, can we use Zenical and what kind of micronutrient deficiency is they given? Or, um, you know, can we prescribe metformin for weight loss? So uh, I think my question is to Eileen, ma'am, are dietitians qualified to prescribe pharmacologic agents? Let's say like uh, metformin, liraglutide, or Listat for weight loss. What are some of the considerations to be made when a doctor or an endocrinologist has put the patients on these pharmacologic agents? And uh, what kind of diets need to be prescribed that will work well with these pharmacologic agents? So, uh, no, no, no ways is dietitian qualified to prescribe these uh, pharmacological agents uh, like, you know, uh, liraglutide or Olistat or any other for weight loss. Uh, because they have a lot of other effects. And we, uh, in our uh, curriculum, we haven't, uh, uh, nor, nor we have learned, nor we have understood, nor we are qualified to prescribe that uh, drugs. Uh, so when we say that let's prescribe what we are qualified for, let others not prescribe diets, we would not prescribe a pharmacological agent because we are not qualified to it. We may know everything about it, but it's not in our purview. Uh, so that is one most important thing. Now, if you feel that your uh, patient can be prescribed something, maybe, you know, today there are patients who just walk into your clinic and they may not be referred to you by a doctor. So, uh, and you feel that, uh, yes, you have done enough and now you 
think that you know probably an only stat or a, a metformin or lira could guide may help uh, your patient to lose more weight rope in your endocrinologist so nowadays we have reverse references where we are referring our patients to our endocrinologist who can help us prescribe that after understanding the physiology and the biochemistry of the patient because it could have an effect on the heart on the heart rate on uh, liver and on so many other organs uh, which are a very uh, you know important organ so these things have to be considered now if it's uh, you come if you have a patient who's already consuming that who's already consuming those drugs then at the same time you look at the drug nutrient interaction you look at the eligibility basically uh, the bmi of the patient uh, weight related uh, health conditions like i i would say for example i have patients who really don't have a, a abnormal bmi but they have just got this a lot of fad of you know just losing weight and being that super slim and super thin and they they insist that they want to take these these drugs so these are the people who need a different type of a counseling they need a probably even a psychologist to help them to understand what is their ex exact body image and uh, body shape so that is uh, one way where you have to understand and only you know those people need to be on drugs who actually need to be on drugs so your healthcare professionals have to be an important part and the other thing to understand is the dosage of administration uh, there are also important uh, aspects when you are considering, say, even an understat for your for a lady who uh, wants to lose weight and probably she's just married. She could be pregnant. Yeah. So uh, you don't know whether she's pregnant or not. So those are the people who we do not take a chance of giving uh, any kind of uh, drugs or medications to them, even if they want to lose weight. So what we advise in such stage is follow a good lifestyle change, follow all the things that Neeti said, and do a, a balanced nutrition plan where you're taking care of macronutrients, micronutrients, fibers, etc. Uh, and all those things are taken care of. So definitely do not prescribe pharmacological agents. Yes, what Neeti also spoke about the adjuncts, like Garcinia Cambogia, certain flour teas, certain teas, uh, meal replacers, uh, protein powders which you have been you know you know uh, and you can prescribe only prescribe those thank you so much for uh, uh, answering that uh, so pharmacologic agents i think we leave the expertise to the doctors and uh, but it's a very important that like you rightly pointed you know if you need to collaborate with maybe doctors maybe an endocrinologist maybe a diabetologist a psychologist or a psychiatrist as well so it's very important that you have a collaborative approach and your diet will only work wonderfully well if you are working with other professionals as well. Um, so I think one of the other, you know, in thing that today people talk about is intermittent fasting. And it is known to work really well in reducing insulin resistance, but there are quite a lot of studies which state that it does not really have any additional benefit as compared to very low calorie diet, like what ma'am rightly pointed out. So uh, some of the studies are, again, short-term studies as well. It may not be effective to sustain the weight that is lost. So what are some of the concerns that we need to look into when we're choosing a candidate for intermittent fasting? Uh, maybe Nazim, ma'am, if you could take this question. Thank you, Sukhita. So that's a very important question that we need to, like you said, you need to choose the correct candidate. If a candidate is prone to acidity, is prone to headache, is, is used to small frequent meals, okay, then maybe not. But there are a lot of, uh, you know, patients who are uncontrolled eaters. And for them to initiate intermittent fasting may be a good idea because, you know, it simply removes those many meals and they are obsessive eaters. So that kind of cuts. So time-restricted eating in those uh, patients help. However, that has to be very well curated because you got to look at, you know, what is an, uh, a very close monitoring on all these patients need to be done. Long-term studies, however, like even Neeti showed in a presentation, like if you look at the look ahead trial, it clearly shows that none of these diet works. What actually works is overall caloric restrictions. So there are a lot of people 
patients who actually eat like gluttons and gluttony is a sin right and so when when you say intermittent fasting they eat a very very large portion thinking that they're not going to eat through the day and that's a high caloric meal and that actually backfires because you're eating more calories and you're creating a, a bigger insulin load and the whole metabolism then goes for a toss. So I think uh, a trained dietitian can identify what is the kind of eater a person is, whether he's a nibbler, he's a snacker, whether he's a big eater. And then if you're a big eater, then not intermittent fasting and use it as a starter to a diet for a balanced diet so that when you see an initial weight loss, the person is motivated and then slowly bring him back to a lower calorie balanced diet. So that's my view on that. So understanding the eating pattern, their metabolic profile is extremely yes. important with putting on something like an intermittent diet. Correct. And also whether the you know client is going to follow through or not, that's something that we need to look into. Yes. As well. um, Ms. Tamanna, this question is for you. Um, in a hospital setting, often, like you said, you know, in your previous uh, question as well, a lot of the patients come already come with critically, you know, uh, obesity or morbid obesity. Now, in such patients, would you aim for weight loss and do you use ideal body weight or present body weight for the energy requirement calculations? Basically, clinical should manage the nutrition of the obese, critically ill patient as any other patient uh, very conservatively in the first week of the ICU stay. And uh, obviously, this is important weight loss and reduction of fat loss, but this is not the primary objective for us. Uh, but uh, in the multiple studies have, you know, that... Uh, demonstrated the positive outcomes in the ICU related to reduce calorie intake. So calorie intake is a very, uh, you know, the calorie uh, intake is a very uh, sensitive uh, as their body composition is uh, very much different. Though they are very obese, but the calculating uh, energy requirement accurately is extremely difficult. Uh, but uh, for the patient, uh, our target goal at, at least within 65 to 75% of the target energy requirement uh, calculating by the uh, indirect calorimetry. And in our hospital, our most of uh, the time we actually, after the assessment, we calculate the BMI. And if it is 30 to 50, then we uh, uh, consider the actual body weight uh, and multiply with it uh, in from 11 to 14 or 15 kilocalorie per kg per actual body weight. But if it is more than 50, then we try to uh, use the ideal body weight and at that time 20 to 25 kilocalorie per kg per body weight. Uh, but our uh, main uh, challenge, uh, we always try to uh, fulfill the protein requirement of the patient as well as the other conditions like if patient is CKD or if patient is a respiratory problem, then we consider the other things. And in this uh, situation, we always communicating with our consultant because, it, you know, it's a multidisciplinary thing. So in that way, in our practice is like this in our hospital, in ICU patient for the uh, obese, critically ill patient. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Tamanna. Eileen, ma'am, in your setting, do you have a similar uh, practice or do you use... Uh, can do you, you repeat the question? You know, ideal body weight for... Uh, Sorry, I didn't hear that. Can you repeat do it? You, do you decide, um, you know, the energy requirements for a critically ill, morbidly obese patient on the basis of present body weight or ideal body weight? Okay, so we have something called the adjusted body weight. Uh, and the calories for the patient, proteins, and the targets are decided based on the adjusted body weight. Okay. Now, the, the adjusted body weight is actually a formula. But uh, to talk to say uh, uh, to talk about it in simple terms, uh, adjusted body weight uh, for an underweight per person, it is the actual body weight, and for an overweight person, it is based on the height and weight of the patient. So that's the adjusted body weight. Uh, now, uh, in a critically ill patient, uh, we, uh, the patient is already in an uh, catabolic state. And at that time, uh, thinking about his, uh, you know, obesity uh, is still a question mark. So we look at completing, reaching the targets uh, first, uh, especially the protein targets, calorie targets, 
uh, because uh, the body's requirements are different at that time. So a uh, patient is already in a state where his albumin is dropping, his uh, levels are dropping, his uh, respiratory is a problem. So those things are of more, more importance than uh, thinking about uh, the weight part. Yeah, so like you rightly said, these patients will be at risk of malnutrition, hospital acquired yeah. sarcopenia as well. So what are some of the you know important considerations that you would want to make when planning a diet for these patients in the ICU setting? Okay. Uh, so when we plan uh, for them in an ICU setting, uh, especially we look out, look out for a high protein, uh, uh, you know, uh, MNT and, uh, you know, even the ONS that is chosen is a high protein. Maybe sometimes we use also a high protein, high fiber. Now that is also added based on the patient's gut uh, microbiome and his uh, state of his uh, gut uh, thing. Uh, besides proteins, of course, we also look at other micronutrients. So on a usual basis, vitamin D, B12, uh, multivitamins, uh, glutamine, all those uh, micronutrients and single functional nutri nutrients are also given. Uh, again, uh, thinking about how many, how many calories to give, we uh, start with 25 calories per kg of the adjusted body weight and then gradually we increase based on the requirement of the patient. So again, it comes to the adjusted body weight. So we do not then take an actual body weight of an obese individual. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, Neetim, and quite a lot of them are asking whether we can prescribe uh, protein supplements. And uh, I think maybe I'll just extend that question a little bit. Little bit. How do how does a dietitian choose meat protein supplements or the adjuncts that you spoke about? How do you ensure that you're choosing the right dosage, the right kind of uh, you know, form of that particular supplement? Right. So um, I think the message is very often clear or the message is got from the gyms that you need to increase your protein intake. The protein, your protein intake is very low. Uh, we need to, first of all, start by calculating uh, the protein, the current protein intake of the patient or the client, whether the person is getting sufficient protein intake. If the person is getting sufficient protein intake through the diet, there is no need. Uh, but very often, it is not sufficient and we need to step up the protein intake. So either we do it through the natural foods, but then there are, when there are challenges where people are working or do, they don't have the prep, time to prepare or the, even the uh, skills to prepare protein-rich dishes, that's where the protein supplement kind of comes in. Uh, also, <coughs> the gym-going population, people who are exercising recreationally but are working out are, is into serious weight training, resistance training, uh, that is another population where we definitely need to step up the protein intake. Uh, generally, we use whey protein, uh, milk dairy protein. We use whey protein immediately post-workout. We would use casein uh, as a bedtime uh, protein, which is slow absorbed and is important for the repair. Uh, this is in the gym going population. People who do not want to take dairy or there is this huge movement towards veganism now, then we all offer alternative sources, which is basically the plant protein, which would be a combination of pea protein with brown rice, or it would be soy protein. Um, so that selection will depend on the patient preference. And if he's following, he or she's following a certain pattern, veganism or is averse to dairy or whatever. But uh, the important caveat is that do not just add protein. If you're looking at weight loss, you need to replace some of the carbohydrates with the protein. Uh, the other very important factor, which a lot of people don't realize, is that carbohydrates can be stored as fat. Fat can be stored as fat. But protein is not stored in the body as protein. So because protein is good, more is better, no, because the nitrogen is deaminated and the, and the rest of the skeleton is again stored as fat. So it is not helping your cause. You need to realize that. And as I said, replace some of the carbs with the protein, not just add two scoops of protein. Uh, we've had enough people who add this kind of protein and the weight loss is not happening. In fact, they've gained weight. So yes, uh, it, they need to be used judiciously. Yeah. 
and again our fraternity the dietitians and nutritionists need to uh, are very important in the protein prescription yeah so again like uh, in terms of protein as well uh, very important that we read the labels we understand what kind of composition it has before we start prescribing it for the patients yeah, Rupi. Before I add something here, Sukhada, yeah. the, to what Neeti ma'am just said, some experiences that I would like to share. So this I've seen with a lot of people, patients are vegetarian. Okay, now ma'am, sometimes when we calculate the proteins and now nowadays they use apps and things like that to calculate. So many vegetarians, they increase their pulse intake to a lot of extent. They still meet uh, their ideal protein requirement of 0.8 to 1 gram by consuming a lot of uh, pulses. So in the bar gain, they're also increasing their calorie and they're increasing the carb intake. So in so many of my patients who are vegetarian, I actually replace that dietary protein with a protein supplement. So at least the quality of protein is better and the ratio of carb to protein is also then balanced. So some of them will start, uh, you know, in replacing and putting pulse in everything. Right from uh, the pulses that they eat or the chapatis that they make. And the vegetables, they'll also add some dal. So they just keep on adding that. Uh, and in the bargain, they're also going beyond uh, their, you know, the caloric requirement. I think that's my experience that I wanted to share. I was saying that because recently there was this girl who was trying to get pregnant and uh, she was prescribed 100 grams of soya every oh. single day. And that was something that she did not even like eating. So for one whole year, she was eating 100 grams of soya every day for both the times. So that is quite uh, something that we need to look into. Okay, just give me a second. Yes, so I think all of us have some weird experiences with terms of proteins. Not only for the gym-going population, but other non-gym goers as well. For gym goers population, the answer is very easy. They just go and pick up a whey protein supplement and they meet their protein requirement. As high as 1.5 1.8 gram per kg. What you're saying is right, Ruby. Actually, uh, they do add a lot of these pulses and sometimes they do come with problems of bloating, uh, mm -hmm. you know, gas, indigestion and all those things. Uh, or sometimes when we want to add these proteins, also they, they say no, they cannot have because they have these problems of gas, indigestion, etc. So, uh, yes, uh, achieving a protein uh, level is uh, is a challenge which it's like it's like an art you know we have to uh, look out for ways and means how we can do like a magical way where we adjust the uh, proteins and, yeah, you know, and i think I, more than the obese patient a pregnant patient is more compliant to protein intake as compared to an obese patient yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we can uh, take some of the questions uh, from the, in chat the meanwhile box. from the chat box yeah yeah uh, so, yes, yes, Sukhda, you're back. So, you can get into questions. Does excessive use of protein powder impact cardiac and renal health? Any of the panelists who would like to take it? I will request the hospital dietitian to give the inputs. Namrud <laughs> always has an input on this, but I think the hospital dietitian okay. should share their. Uh, so, Definitely, if you are already ha you are a CKD patient and you are uh, having a renal compromised uh, portfolio or a profile, that's when you cannot just go overboard with proteins. You have to have a protein that's prescribed to you. So if you are a CKD patient and you need proteins, then your dietitian along with your nephrologist will decide whether you want 0.6 or you need 0.8 grams of proteins. Uh, then if the uh, very accurate calculation has to be done and based on that, the proteins have to be advised if the person is a renal patient. Uh, coming to cardiac patients, uh, also the kind of proteins for a cardiac patient is important because many of the proteins, especially uh, non-vegetarian proteins, come with a lot of fat also along with it. Sometimes they are prepared, their preparations have got high fat in it. So they uh, say the onions are deep fried or they have a lot of nuts or, you know, the magaj that is added to, uh, to make the, uh, uh, the you know, almonds and a lot of nuts are added to make the gravy stick. So uh, when you are a cardiac patient, you have to think about the combination of fat with protein uh, as well. So those are the different aspects in different way, me medical conditions you have to think of how you are going to prescribe proteins in what manner and in what way. Yeah. 
Also, um, I think the combinations again are very important. So, like how you're pairing your serial to your pulses and completing the amino acid profile, I think that's also an important consideration, especially on Asian diets, which are largely serial based, and you're trying to fit in a protein, and people are not really used to. So, I think, uh, you know, the combination element is a very important one, and we need to educate the patients on that as well. Yeah, there is this question coming quite a lot. Uh, how do we choose the right kind of protein supplement? I think Aniti Ma'am has touched upon it a little bit on in her presentation. Um, who would like to take this question? Ruby, would you like to take? Yes, yeah, so as a professional, the factors or the point that I would consider before selecting a protein supplement, when I know the amount of protein to begin with, the type of the quality of protein. First of all. Uh, we know that uh, proteins uh, which has a complete amino acid profile or PDCAS-1 would be ideal. But now in PDCAS-1, we have all whey isolates, we have uh, soya isolates also which have PDCAS-1. of one. Now again, I will see the profile of the patient. Okay, I will see if the patient is a person who is physically very active. And when do I prescribe a protein supplement? If I have to give a protein supplement which is going to be a post exercise or a post workout if it fits into that slot then i have to look for a supplement which is fast absorbing in nature so that it works at the right time and absorption is far better i can't give a protein which is casein based which is going to take a longer time for this however if a patient is the one where i need to give the protein for dinner because of other challenges or the person is working a night shift or the person is even working out late evening or the person doesn't have enough support system at home to have a high protein meal at dinner, then I would pick up a protein supplement which is casein based supplement. So my choice will depend a lot on many other factors. Besides this, now protein supplements also come with uh, peptide based formulas and probiotic as a component. So based on the, and because we have a lot of options available, we should not miss that whether it is a peptide based formula or whether it is a, you know, preferably I always prefer a whey based formula because of its uh, well you know bioavailability and other things but i also will look at the price factor because you know a lot of times you want to give a protein isolate but will that be affordable for a patient beyond six weeks beyond four weeks because it's not just only a matter of few weeks that i need to give i need to think of a long term this and suppose we are looking at muscle gain that's another thing if the patient is sarcopenic or the person is who's going to build up muscle cell to preserve the lean muscle mass, I need to see the amino acid profile. Higher the amount of branch and amino acids is very important. But looking at the leucine content, because we know that leucine is going to preserve muscle. So even I have to consider that point as well before I look at any options available. Of course, flavors are now easily available. So I would consider flavor also as one of the deciding factors. This will help me besides knowing the macronutrient profile of the protein supplement. That helps me decide which one to sue. So I actually keep up sheet ready with me from the currently available uh, you know formula that helps me decide which is the most ideal for the uh, patient who's in front of me i think that can be a very like a ready reckoner for all the practicing dietitians thank you ruby so the quality of protein is something that's important the timing at which you're going to give the protein is important and of course the economics as well because when we plan for the patient we want them to actually consume what you're planning on the paper so that's also something that's very important as well um I think, Nazim ma'am, you mentioned in one of your answers that you replace protein with carbs. So one of the participants is asking, what should be the ratio? Should it be one is to one? Um, or how much of carbs should be replaced with protein? Uh, even if we replace, so like if you look at the total dietary composition, we're looking the typical Indian diet or an Asian diet has around you know, it's around 70% carbs, 15, 10% to 15% proteins, and uh, the rest of it is fat. So I think reducing that 15 to 20% carb and bringing it to 50 and upping your protein content to at least 20 to 25% of the total diet, I think can be a significant game changer in this entire diet. So you don't have to go completely off carbs. In fact, most uh, diets which show which are less than forty percent carbs have backfired. 
So leave the carbs to 50%, but even that 10 to 15% carbs, if you replace it with the proteins, then it could be distributed through the day. In fact, uh, feeding protein even in between meals can be a very very good solution because people don't want to really change their main basic meals so you know using mid-morning or mid-evening or late night uh, could be great opportunities for introducing these protein-based uh, you know snacks or formulas or replacers and um, they would very effectively work in a calorie restricted setup again thank you ma'am i think um like you rightly said, it can either be in between the meals or it could be a part of the meal itself. Something as simple as replacing one roti and increasing your portion of dal or having a little more chicken and less of the biryani rice, that itself will take care of the protein and the carb ratio. We look at meal sequencing also today and we say that the moment you, you know, start with your protein and your fiber and then you follow the meal, automatically your consumption of your male meal drops because the satiety factor greatly increases. So these are some strategies also which one can use uh, for weight loss. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. So our Southeast Asian continent is actually a very big dominant, uh, you know, area. And yet, uh, we see a lot of people going on a gluten-free diet, and then they find it very difficult to sustain. So there's one question in the audience wherein they're asking, does wheat delay weight loss? Open to any of the panelists, whoever would like to take it. Uh, so, so, okay. <laughs> uh, these days, when we do a few food sensitivity reports, um, there seems to be some wheat sensitivity. Having said that, because we have been eating wheat for the longest time, uh, we still have to prove unless and until you've done some detailed tests and shown that, okay, wheat does have a challenge. However, when one puts them temporarily on a gluten-free diet, what happens is all the refined carbs, the all-purpose flour, all the ultra-processed foods, all of them also suddenly go off the diet and the diet suddenly becomes more healthier and we're also celebrating the year internationally year of millets so adding a little millets i'm not saying completely replacing them maybe just adding to what they're ex already eating right now could be a good solution so uh, replacing partial wheat the especially the refined wheat products to millets and uh, you know switching over that could be a good proposition yes yeah so i think gluten sensitivity is a bigger problem than insulin sensitivity among people now, the advantage here you see like nazin said we cannot prove that yes it has caused uh you know inflammatory issues over the years but what i feel is that you know since they're scared of gluten sensitivity or since we can scare them of gluten sensitivity we can reduce the carb intake to a lot of extent we can replace it with millets or with protein. So somewhere, uh, to some extent, this fear actually works in our favor for weight management people. So they are off all the unhealthy and the refined cupboard. But a lot of my patients, they may not have a significant improvement in the weight loss, mm -hmm. but they come up with, uh, you know, improvements in the GI issues. A lot of them have been, you know, uh, you know, establishing the fact that, yes, once they leave the gluten, they feel better, they feel lighter. Now, this could be a psychological impact uh, that they have left to gluten or it is real it's too early to say that i think um, we should uh, completely go off gluten for a few years and then decide whether it works or not thank you ruby thank you for that so i think the questions are going to keep pouring in um but i think we need to stop at some point so can i like have one take-home message from each of you and before we start with that uh, participants i will be posting three links in the chat box one is your feedback link for all the sessions. One is the revision link, which has all the YouTube recordings. And the third link is for the actual final exam. So make sure you please copy that because it will not be emailed to you. It will only be posted in the chat box. So over to the panelists, if I can have like one take home message from each of you. Okay, I can start. Uh, the take home message is that um, Obesity is a journey uh, and getting healthy is also a journey. It, it cannot be done very fast. Uh, the important thing is to have a connect with your patient uh, to make them trust you and 
they should you know uh, you you should be a friend to them because i think uh, they they trust you fully when they come to you with a lot of hopes uh, and uh, they will listen to you if they have that faith in you uh, these things will be there and we cannot eat the entire elephant in one shot so one day teach them portion control one day you can teach them uh, on different aspects of diet one day you can teach them how they can you know adopt to new activity so that's how you can inculcate a few uh, messages for their lifestyle uh, over a period of time uh, that's all i have to say thank you ma'am uh, neeti ma'am yes uh, i think when we are dealing with obesity uh, very often we are not just the nutritionist or the dietitian we are the counselor we are the patient listeners i think the most important thing is to be the patient listener because uh, as we've seen there is hedonic eating there is emotional eating unless we get that area right unless we patiently hear about that we will not get the solution we will not get the results so have to be patient how to also do the role of counseling and of course when required obviously involve the other team members as we discussed but yes it's a nutritionist come counselor come friend come a patient listener all rolled into one when we are dealing with obesity thank you so much ma'am nancy ma'am okay so i think uh, it's adherence it's sustainability no uh, weight loss diet can be a short one time counseling it has to be well planned i think uh, it takes the team of the nutritionist the other caregivers the patient and the other healthcare team to plan and map this journey and to explain what would be the stages and handhold at every stage and uh, i think uh, you know getting uh, today empowering the patient with more knowledge rather than telling him what to do you know do it my way i think is a better way because once they understand they do so i think helping them move in that direction with changes in behavioral modification actually helps mindful eating definitely helps thank you so much ma'am uh, mr manna uh basically weight loss is a journey and i always feel as a dietitian that counseling is the very important part of this journey if we counsel our patient we motivate our patient because we as a dietitian i never want a everyday new patient i want my follow up patient and that should be my achievement that my patient is following me and she is listening to me and i also have to listen to my uh, patient uh, so as a friend basically we have to uh, talk with them as a family member because you know for the weight reduction diet not only a prescription of a diet i have to set their menus also so i need to know uh, their kitchen thing also so this is a very important part it's a long journey and sustainable weight loss is our main priority not the quick weight reduction Thank you so much, um, Mr. Manna. We left it to Ruby for the final word. <laughs> okay. So for a successful weight loss, I think in the first interaction that the dietitian has with the patient, we need to shift the goal setting. So we need to shift the goal setting from only the number of kilograms. We need to shift the focus to fat loss, and we need to shift the focus to a better cardio metabolic health of the patient. If the patient looks at all these. you know added benefits of weight loss more than the number of kilograms being lost i think the adherence improves the compliance improves and the trust on the caregiver improves far better so if we can establish that in the very first session i think half we have won half the battle uh, i think that can help a lot of people to lose weight uh, in a shorter duration of time rather than you know taking years to accomplish the same goal The, the goal itself should shift from weight loss to fat loss or metabolic improvements thank you so much for all the inputs uh, dear panelists um from the bottom of my heart i thank all the friends colleagues mentors uh, gurus who have been a part of this entire lecture series uh, it wouldn't have been possible without support from all of you 
So therefore, um, let me take this opportunity to call upon Zamrud Ma'am, who has been our backbone uh, in planning this session, to give a formal vote of thanks on behalf of Indian Dietetic Association, Mumbai chapter. Hi, good evening to all. And firstly, I would like to wish everyone a very happy Women's Day. We were uh, fortunate to learn through this entire conceptualized series on clinical nutrition. Firstly, I would like to thank my IDA team, Sukda, Ruby, Megha, Shraddha, and of course, there are many others who behind the scene really helped us to combine the various lectures and come out with this wonderful series. Friends, it's a proud privilege to tell you that for this series, we had more than 1500 total registrations for this uh, clinical nutrition series. And uh, we had people from almost 26 countries who attended these series. We, have, we had people from six countries who were speakers for various sessions. And I have to emphasize that all the sessions that we did on clinical nutrition, the various clinical nutrition formulas, the polymeric, the semi-elemental, we talked about malnutrition, we talked about diabetes, we talked about pediatric nutrition, we, today we were talking about uh, uh, obesity, even we had a session on cancer, hypermetabolic state. So whatever sessions we learned, I'm sure that all of us have really gained a lot from all these sessions. Lastly, I should not forget to thank our partners who, may, who have partnered with IDA Mumbai chapter. We have Kenya Medical Training College, Kenyatta Hospital. Of course, we have Clinical Nutrition Excellence Academy, Hexagon Nutrition for supporting us for this activity. I'm sure that we all have learned a lot. I firstly would also want to thank my IDA family for helping throughout these series, each other and getting it through. I'm sure that this has been a wonderful journey for all of us whoever has attended these series have really learned a lot. Mm -hmm. So again, behind the cur curtains, the people who have worked very hard for this series, Sukda, Megha, Shraddha, Ruby, I really thank you. And I congratulate the full team for putting up this wonderful clinical nutrition series. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I think we started with thinking that Two, three countries will attend and we had participation from over 23 countries we had experts from over six countries and uh, you know we keep getting requests people who have missed out the initial sessions they would want to attend it as well so thank you so much for all the support can i also quickly have uh one Bita on board to give a formal vote of thanks on behalf of yeah. Yeah. yeah good evening everyone and yeah wishing again happy women's day to everyone and I would take this opportunity to sincerely thank IDM Mumbai chapter who has been the backbone of this program. And Jamrun Nan, thank you so much. And everyone here uh, for making this program a big success. And uh, I also thank all the panelists who have been representing from ID Mumbai chapter in Mumbai in various parts of the country. We had panelists from Chennai, Bangalore, Kolkata coming in and uh, supporting this program. And also our speakers from six different countries. We thank Thank everyone to be making this program successful and also our academic partner KMTC who have been uh, also an equal partner in making this program a big success and I think this was our first initiative of having an inter cross country uh, webinar series where we had panelists from India and six different countries and we got a very good response for it and I sincerely thank Jamrud ma'am here and everyone here to make it and last but not the least Sugda for tying this all together between Hexagon and uh, IDM Mobile chapter. So thank you, everyone, and thank you. And we request all participants to please go through the exam link and take benefit of all the six, 10 sessions what we had from right from basic enteral nutrition on enteral nutrition formulas to weight management session today, what we ended. So thank you, everyone, once again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vandita. Thank you, everyone.